ahead and announce, did you announce that thing about P101? Perfect. All right. How is everybody this morning? Amen. Um, I have to, uh, before we get started, and I am actually very excited to share with you about um, today's teaching that I feel is uh, something that every single person in this room can relate to. I'll tell you, like, I'm going to try to use PowerPoint. All right, I'm going to try. It's, it's getting worse, gang, I'm telling you. If you come out Thursday nights, it's just like, forget it. You never know where it is I'm going to go and what it is that's going to come out of my mouth, but we have a fun time. In fact, for those of you that uh, don't know what Thursday nights is, that's, that's a prophetic service. And what I mean by that is, honestly, man, we try to be as spirit-led as we can be. And it's not that I don't come with a plan, and it's not that I don't have, feel like I have something in my heart that the Lord wants to say, but... Man, if he wants to change, and boy, he does. I'm telling you, he does. The other night, he had me preach on the... I'm sitting there, and, and just what, the way I go about Thursday nights is I pace that wall back there, and I pray in tongues the entire time until it's my time to get up and, and preach. And the other night, I was back there, and I was praying in tongues, and the Lord said, I want you to preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I just said, okay. And we had some pretty neat things happen about two Thursdays ago. And uh, there were some people here, and I'll tell you what, that service keeps growing, man. It's averaging about 50, 60 people, Tony, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger, you know? And it's because people, they're hungry to encounter God. We're seeing God do some pretty neat and awesome things, amen? So, um, but I'm going to talk to you today about something that I just believe everybody in the room at some point in time, let me just hit, turn that off, that could be my wife. My poor Shiloh, she, uh, she woke up, well, she didn't wake up, all night, Saturday, no, Friday night into Saturday, she had very labored breathing, couldn't breathe, deep belly breathing, <sighs> boy, that was scary real quick as a parent. And uh, so we had to rush her to urgent care yesterday. I had to buy a nebulizer, so she's got this breathing treatment thing going on. They put her on prednisone, which is a steroid, and man, that's what you want your kids on. It just kind of jacks them up and gets them ready and rowdy. And she's got an ear infection on top of that. Now Nicole's with Lily at the urgent care because we think Lily has one as well. But um, no, it's okay because all that stuff, listen, I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is our year, guys. I'm telling you, and like, and, and I've, been, I've been preaching on it. In fact, I went there Thursday night. We can't let what we're walking through to overwhelm what the gospel's accomplished. We can't. We have to be very careful where we put our eyes. The fight of faith is what you choose to look at. It's not punching the devil in the mouth. What you put your eyes on is what you're choosing to believe. What you put your eyes on has the ability to shape you. It's going to change the way that you see. That's why you can't run a race looking down at your belly. It doesn't work, guys. You run a race with endurance. How? Fixing your eyes on Jesus. But the fight, guys, is are you going to keep them there? There is nothing in this life God can't redeem. Nothing. No thing that he can't use and bring something out of it. No thing. And he said to me one day, and you're free to disagree with me, he said, sometimes, Brian, the only way I can get beauty is from ashes. Because it doesn't make any sense. The world would say, there's no way, and I'm going to tell you, I can't believe I'm on this again. It's not my message, but here we are. The greatest question everybody in this room has to answer while you're walking through stuff is, can these bones live? That's the question you've got to answer. God doesn't ask you a question because he's looking for your great counsel and wisdom. He don't need it. He doesn't. He asks you a question because he wants to change the way you're looking at it. He's bringing you into conversation. He's bringing you into relationship. Guys, when, when Ezekiel's in that valley in chapter 37, probably the most famous chapter in his entire book, you, want to get, you, you think science fiction is weird? Read Ezekiel. That thing is weird, man. He's doing all kinds of stuff. I'm just glad I'm not that kind of prophet that has to have those kinds of experiences. I wouldn't want them. But there are times, guys, and I've experienced some of it in my own life, where what a person's asked to do and what they're walking through and what they're going through is the Word. Because the Word becomes flesh in certain individuals. And God will take the example of what's going on in a person's life and say, this is what I'm declaring to my people. And I believe it is our year, guys, to arise and shine. And that means this. You're only going to shine if there's darkness. It's very hard for, for if I were to light a match in this room right now, it would be very hard 
for it to do what it is it's designed to do, not just emit heat, but to provide light. But if you turn the lights off, boy, that match is going, one little match will do a great deal. But it is not, and I'm not poking fun because I know we sing it, and we sang it last week, and we do it at church camp, and I know it's a children's song, but come on, man, it's not this little light of mine. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, and he's shown pretty bright. And then he said in Matthew 5, you're the light of the world. Behold, the people are sitting in deep darkness in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, and behold, upon them a light has dawned. What they couldn't see before, they can now see. What they didn't know to change their mind about, they now see the truth. When they were lost, now they can be found. The way's been made wide open, now just come back home. But it doesn't mean, gang, it does not mean that our life is exempt and free from stuff. The Christian life is not the guarantee, guys, that things are not going to go wrong. In fact, it invites it, if you want me to be honest with you. It's going to come, it's going to test. Listen, God forbid, and I said this Thursday night, God forbid, guys, we are only as strong as the songs we sing in our church attendance. The enemy is not impressed with your ability to quote scripture at all. He's not impressed with you sitting here in the room. He's not, listen, guys, God forbid, listen, God forbid we are singing, I have this hope, and then that hope gets tested and we find out we never had it. And I'm not saying, guys, that tears don't fall. I'm not saying that. Faith doesn't deny the existence of what we're walking through. It acknowledges it and says, but I see something bigger. Though my eyes see a valley called the shadow of death, my heart will not fear. Why? Because my heart sees something different because you're with me in the middle of it. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So listen to me, guys. He is not impressed with our ability to sing, guys. He honestly, he thinks you're you're all talk if you want me to be real with you. And he'll he'll say, okay, we'll find out. We'll find out. Now here I am preaching this Thursday night and what happens? I think my daughter's going to die. She can't breathe. Talk about getting tested immediately. And you put your hand and you're doing everything that you know to do as a Christian. Father, I just bless her in the name of Jesus. Lungs, I command you to work. Lungs and airways open up. Nothing's changing. It makes your mind go bananas. And I believe this. I believe that God's people are going to get to a place. Man, I preached a bunch of stuff Thursday, didn't I, Dane? I got on fasting. I got on all kinds of stuff. I was, do, 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 do. Why? Because I believe we're going to get to the place where we're just not going to tolerate it anymore, guys. When's that going to happen where we just say, that's it, that's enough, not on my watch, not on my dime, like, I just can't let that go on anymore, not if it's available, not if it's possible. So, so he's not impressed with your ability to sing, guys, listen, like, I'll tell you what he is impressed by, he's impressed and he's scared to death of your surrender. You lay your life down on behalf of the Lord. You lay your life down. Say, it doesn't belong to me. God, I give it to you. He's scared to death, guys, of your surrender and the anointing of God. He's scared to death of it. So God takes Ezekiel. I'm I'm probably not going to get to the PowerPoint. (laughs) I will preach it, girl. I don't know who has said that. God takes Ezekiel and he puts him in this valley. Guys, that valley is the nation of Israel. Those bones represent the nation of Israel. And it says that they're dry. And not just dry, it says they're very dry. Listen to me, gang. That's, an, it, that's a hopeless situation. It is void of hope. There's no life there. And sometimes things hit us. And sometimes we're walking through stuff. And the enemy would come and say, let's see your God do something with that. Let's see if you really, let's see what you're really made of. I'll touch you here and I'll touch you there and we'll find out if, listen, because the Christian faith isn't the great profession, it's the great demonstration. It's not just a confession. It's the ability to become something. Grace is doing something in me that the law couldn't do. Grace is doing something in me to live a holy life, to see the Lord, to be empowered to live what it is that I'm called to do. But it's by His empowerment, it's by His grace, and He's opening up our eyes to see, guys, what's available for us to step in, to walk in. But I'll tell you this, if I do not know the will of God, 
And the Bible talks about that we shouldn't be unwise, but when we shouldn't be foolish, but we should know what the will of the Lord is. Romans 12 says we should be able to prove what the will of God is. And if I can't prove it, then maybe I'm not convinced of it yet. There is a place in Christ, listen to me guys, you're not going to talk me out of it. There's a place in Christ where I touch Shiloh and she's instantly healed. Instantly. If Jesus were in the room, it would have been a done deal. And he said, now you go. You're a Christian, guys, a Christ-like one, a little Christ-like one. Who He puts his kingdom inside of you, breathes his life upon you, empowers you with the Holy Spirit. And guys, now that I'm up here, to be honest with you, man, like, I, 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 just, I, I, I just get tired, guys, of letting it go by on our watch. And I'm going to tell you something. It is on you and I. And I understand we don't see every prayer prayer or every prayer answered, guys. And there's a place where we don't take our eyes off of him in the midst of it. Because it says in Hebrews chapter 2 that God has subjected the earth to men. He's quoting, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Psalm chapter 8. Which is what? Who, 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 who's man that you're mindful of him, God? Yet you've made him a little bit lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory. And you've put all things in subjection under his feet. You want to know something? This actually is in the PowerPoint, but if we get there, that's fine. You have a position in the spirit. There's an authority that you and I have that God wants us to understand this year. It's one thing to understand identity. And what I mean by that is it's one thing to understand right standing in God. It's another thing to understand the authority that I carry. So Lou Laux is sitting over here on the way. Well, there he is right there. Lou Laux is a police officer. Now, if Lou Laux goes out in civilian clothing like he's wearing right now and, and is trying to direct traffic, not many people are going to be listening to him. I already have a hard enough time listening to the cops when they're directing traffic anyway. I was going bananas, man. When it was, when it was uh, Rocky Ridge, that Christmas stuff, man, I'm sitting on that hill. I'm like, come on, man. Because the cops, anyway, no, I respect authority. But I'll tell you what, man. I'll tell you what, traffic, boy, that'll, that'll test you. <laughs> but if Lou, if Lou went out in the street with his uniform on, instant respect. Instantly. Why? Because that uniform transforms him. And he's given the authority that's afforded to him by the state of Pennsylvania. He's given the authority... To be able to do what? To stand there, be able to direct traffic and, and everything else. And if you and I could just understand our authority, man, the enemy is going to have to respect and honor that. But if we don't, he'll take advantage of it. He can't have it. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said, which means what? By default, somebody don't have any. But if we don't understand our authority and our place in the spirit, the enemy is going to try to occupy our territory and position and he's going to try to take it away. Sometimes the things you and I are walking through in life are designed to intimidate us so that we don't step in and occupy what's rightfully ours. So God puts Ezekiel in this valley. And he asks him a question. He says, hey, can these bones live? Guys, there's nothing on the bones. They're dry. Nothing. It's death in the valley. There's no life there. Nothing is there. Can these bones live? This was the prophet's response. I love it. It's brilliant. Oh God, you know. Because he didn't want to say, oh, I'm not really sure. Yes, maybe so. Like, And this is what he says. He says, prophesy to the bones. So he does. And he says, prophesy to the breath. Why? Because it's the breath of God. It's the spirit of God that brings life to hopeless situations. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't understand the will of God in the midst of what you're walking through, you'll never know how to speak to it. You'll never know how to prophesy into it. I know what the will of God is through the life of Jesus. I see it. His will is that everybody would repent and come home. His will is to heal. His will is to deliver from demonic oppression. His will is to forgive. His will is, that the, his will is that forgiveness would be profuse, man. His will is that mercy speaks louder, guys. He's sitting on a mercy seat. But his blood's crying out greater things than the blood of Abel. 
I know it's his will that people would be reconciled and come back together. Why? Because he took those of us who were enemies and reconciled us to himself through the Son. I know his will is redemption. I know his will is to rebuild the ancient ruins, the former devastations, the things that life laid bare. And there is not a stone that's been toppled over that he can't rebuild. There's nothing he can't overturn in this life, guys. But if I don't know what the will of God is, I won't speak into that situation. And if I'm not careful, I'm taking life as it comes rather than overcoming. So I said before, what you put your eyes on is what determines what what you choose to believe in the moment. That's why when Israel is in the wilderness and these snakes are coming out and they're, listen guys, man, I'm going to say some sharp stuff. Are you okay? Because God's teaching me this too. I'll tell you right now. God tells them, God tells us, God tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 to not make the same mistake the Israelites did. These things are recorded for our example. Listen to me, guys. God is bringing us to the place, I'm telling you, where it's just not about us. You can't arise and shine if life is about you in any way. And the clearest sign that it's still about you and I is when we complain. When you complain, it's the dead giveaway that it's all about you. And you can't find it in Jesus' life. And he said, follow me. Not a whole lot of amens on that one. But it's true. You want to know why they were laid low in the wilderness? They complained. They wanted to go back to where they came from for the food. You want to know how you get close to God? Stop eating. Fast. Pray. But I'll tell you this, like I said Thursday night, it's not about the what in your fasting, it's the why behind it. It's your motive. It doesn't matter what you fast. And demons hate fasting. Because if we're not careful, we live to eat. We don't eat to live. And God is bringing his people, man, I feel it even now, wholly dissatisfied with what we let go on our watch. When we're called to redeem the time, like Pastor Adam often preaches. Evil is running loose because the church still isn't shining yet. What you tolerate becomes your culture. We cannot afford any longer to tolerate sin in our life, in our home, in our churches. It'll quench the anointing of God. It'll quench the move of God. And like I said at the beginning of this year, I prophesied it in December 31st. It is one thing, guys. Oh, just come out and say it. You can't say Jesus is your friend and not lay your life down for him. Greater love has no one than this than one that lays his life down for his friend. So if you don't lay your life down for him, he ain't your friend. You can say it all you want. You got to give up what you hold on to. You got to let go of what it is that is holding you back, called you. Your rights. Dead men, dead women don't have rights. God is bringing us to a place of absolute denial and surrender. God is bringing us to a place of deeper consecration. What I mean by that is this, that we bid the world goodbye more than you ever considered or realized because you're desperate and you're hungry for Him. Because you want Him, because you want more of Him. And God's bringing us to a place where we no longer say He loves me, but that we emphatically say, I love Him. And there's a big difference. Those that love Him keep His commands. That... Those that love him, obey him. Can these bones live? Can what you're facing right now, can God do something with it? That's the question. Yes or no? 
Even if you can't see it, can you do something with it? Yeah. Then prophesy to your situation. What if your husband's acting like a knucklehead? What if your husband's disobedient to the truth, like it says in 1 Peter 3? What if your husband isn't into Jesus as much as you are? Father, I thank you right now for my husband. You saw him before his time. There's not one person you're not passionately pursuing. And I see a day and a time, God, where your love is going to overtake him and collide with him. And in the meantime, God, you've given me a charge to live my life in gentleness and peace. Not point out what's wrong with him, but he can be won over by my quiet behavior, like First Peter 3, not quiet behavior, but that your behavior like Sarah comes out. Thank you for destiny in his life. Thanks for choosing him. Thanks for loving him, even when he can't love himself, which that's the whole point, gang. When people don't love themselves, they don't do right. And God wants to bring us to a place, man. I know you're going to laugh at me. That's fine. But I'll tell you right now, there's a reason why the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Ah, oh, hey. Come on, man. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to tell you something. Nick Billman texted me that morning. Super Bowl Sunday. Now, there's, there's something that's called the lectionary that pastors will use. Adam and I don't use it. But there, there's, there's a, a tool, if I could say it that way, that will give you scriptures for the next 52 Sundays of the year that you'll preach out of. And it kind of does the work for you so that you, if you don't want to get alone with God and ask Him, what do you want me to say? It kind of does the work for you. You know what you're going to be preaching on. And Nick texted me that morning. Now this thing is done months in advance before 2018 hits. Nick Billman, who's an emphatic Eagles fan, texts me and says, you'll never guess what the verse is for this Sunday in the lectionary. I said, what is it? They'll rise up on wings like eagles. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, oh wow. Well, can God care about a football game? God can speak through a football game. And what's the whole point? What if God wants to raise you up above what it is you're walking through? They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and they won't faint. What if God is taking us to a place, guys, where we see what we're walking through from a different vantage point? What if we lift up our eyes to where our help comes from? What if we look up to the hills? What's that? It's a natural way of saying get your eyes off of what you're going through and put them up where they actually belong. So Jesus, it says of him, that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the worst instrument of torture that's ever been created by mankind. Isaiah 52 says that Jesus was marred more than any other man. That means Mel Gibson did a great job, but he didn't fully capture it. I told my 10-year-old the other day, and I mean, I said, honey, get ready because we're going to watch that together very soon. I can't watch that. No, you need to watch that. No more singing, I'll never know how much it costs. God wants you to know how much it costs. Because it'll break you, and it'll put you on your knees, and it'll build something in you. And according to 1 Peter 1, it actually will build the fear of the Lord in you. When you see what it is that mercy accomplished for your sake. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Well, how can you go through something like that if your eyes aren't on what that's going to produce? If your eyes are on what you're walking through and you don't see something greater than what you're walking through, then what you're walking through is going to speak louder than truth. And all life is, guys, all of life is a test. All of it. All of it. There's not one thing in life that's not a test. Even the good times is a test to find out, do they still really love me? Or do they love what I do for them? See, that's what Satan believes. We'll find out. We'll find out if they just have really good pipes on a Sunday morning or if they really mean what they're singing. We'll find out. I'll come and I'll test them. 
And I'll tell you this right now. We think the ability to see the sick healed is the greatest evidence of a testimony. Uh Uh-uh. You being able to walk through hell and come out on the other side is the testimony. That's the testimony. Jesus never changed. Ever. He remained the same. Why? Because love can't fail. He's not coming down off the cross, gang. It's not even an option. Love doesn't fail. Because he was all about his Father's name, not his name. Oh, Father, glorify your name. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. But don't think for a minute, gang. The greatest test in life, the greatest test in life is you and I trying to satisfy the will of God while staying alive, and it don't work. You can't. You've got to die. And life's coming to see if you are dead to yourself or if you're very much alive. And what comes out of your mouth reveals you and offense reveals you. When we're offended, we're revealed. So God has me personally on this journey. Am I perfect in this area? My gosh, no. I just told you I get agitated in traffic. But I know this. I see something in Christ that's available to me and you can't talk me out of it and that's where I'm going. And I wake up in the morning and I thank God that life isn't about me today. And life isn't about my kids acting right. And life isn't about whether or not my spouse takes notice of stuff. My life isn't about whether or not she says this or does that or Adam does this or does that. Like It's, it's honestly me learning to find everything in Christ because it's all satisfied there anyway. In Him we live and move and have our being. In Him is life, it says in Acts 17. All things come down from Him. But if we're not careful, listen guys, it never, it never says, listen, the storm comes to the wise and foolish. Just because you're wise doesn't mean you're not exempt from the storm. But be careful how you build. Because the wind is coming and the waves are coming and it's going to find out what's going to stand and what's going to fall. And I find that a lot of us guys, I find a lot of us are emotional, we're pumped, we're hyped, and a lot of us are more like that one kind of soil in the parable of the, the sower than we realize. That sometimes a lot of us, we get so pumped up when we hear the word of the kingdom. That's the whole point of the parable. The word of the kingdom goes forth. Well, what's the word of the kingdom? Everything that's available in the kingdom. And so we hear certain things. The sick can be healed. The people can be set free. There's forgiveness. There's life. There's all these things. And all of a sudden, that word is going to get tested, guys. But we receive it with joy. We're just all pumped up. And all of a sudden, life comes and says, okay, let's see if you're really rooted and grounded yet. You say you believe in the sick getting healed. Let me see when I touch your daughter and she can't breathe if you stand firm or if you panic. And what happens to that seed? What happens in that soil? The sun comes out and persecutes it. See, we think that's just our friends and our family disagreeing with us. No, that's the enemy coming and tempting you to believe something other than what you say you believe. And the sun comes out and scorches it and it withers it away. Withers away. Why? Because it never had an opportunity to lay its root down. It had no depth of root in itself. So why don't we then get rooted and grounded in love like Ephesians 3 says and not leave that place and try to move on to deeper things? No, the love of Christ is deep. It's waking up and knowing he's not going anywhere. He's chosen you. He loves you. You're in him. Your life is hidden in him. He's in you. You're not eternally separated anymore. He's breathed his life on you. He's put his spirit inside of you. Mercy's new every single morning. What if we take that stance when we wake up? There's nothing we can't walk through then. Everything is coming to test. Even the promotions you get. Guys, you want to know what I think the greatest test for Jesus was? When they're coming, like, let's make this guy king. When everybody's saying all the right things and you're this, it's so easy to be like, oh man, that makes me feel so when you pull your value and this and that. Jesus never, Jesus said he didn't entrust himself to people. He knew what was in people. Your closest family, your closest friends, in a moment, guys, you find out they're not who you think they are. But he never changes. He's unchanging, guys, and he's not leaving.
Man, it's our time, guys. Like, you can't shine unless you walk through certain things. I'm not asking and wishing for those things, but when they're upon us, it's our time. And now the world gets to see how we handle things, how the church responds. That we're not complaining and backbiting and putting people down. No, forgiveness is coming out. Because we see something bigger than what we're walking through. I am so glad my, my mom never gave up on me. Man, she had every right to. You have no idea who I was. I was one of the biggest jerks on the planet, man. I was a thief. I stole relentlessly from people. I was fired from my job because I'd be stealing cartons of cigarettes and stuffing them in my bag and ran, took advantage of a single mom. Did drugs on the porch. I felt like I had a right to because I was so hurt. Treated her like trash, swore in her face, doing the best she could to make ends meet. Just filled with self, concerned about self. I destroyed property. Oh, I, you have no idea. There was this Group, I can't believe, I mean, uh, there was a group of people that were going to build this development behind my house. There were tractor trailer loads of stuff in there for the, my brothers and I, we busted the lock off, broke in there, and we destroyed what was in there. Thousands and thousands of people, cops looking for who did it. I didn't care, man, I was a renegade. My mom never stopped, never stopped praying. You are not legally allowed to look at somebody with the eyes that Jesus doesn't have. He can change anybody. And I tell people my story and they look at me and they say, really? That's the point. That's the whole point. Can these bones live? God, you know. And in a moment, God changed the way Ezekiel was looking at a situation. You can't, guys, we can't allow what we're walking through to dictate what we understand to be true in Jesus. We just can't. Then it'll overcome us, it'll overtake us, it'll overwhelm us. And that's when we become ineffective. So the Israelites are in the wilderness. They're complaining. They're grumbling. Why'd you bring us out here? Forty years of wandering. Forty years. And we'll wonder for forty years if it's about us. But if it's about the Father, and if it's about His will, and if it's about satisfying Him, bearing witness to His image, if it's about His love and His grace, and it ain't about us, wonder if the journey's only forty days, and we come out empowered in the Spirit and truth. Forty years wandering around the wilderness. Snakes come out and start attacking them. God tells Moses, I want you to take a staff and put a bronze serpent on this staff. And as long as the people keep their eye on it, they'll be healed. As long as you're not looking at the snakes biting you. Because they're going to come and bite. And they're going to test. But as long as you keep your eyes, well, Brian, you don't understand. I've been doing that for a while. There's no time limit on that. There's no time limit on. I don't know how long the suffering lasts, but I know this, that God has in the moment can turn mourning to joy in the morning. He can turn suffering into joy in the morning. And sometimes, guys, the making process just isn't fun. I wouldn't want King David's making process. I wouldn't want to be a man without a country. I wouldn't want to be a man, king trying to kill me, my oldest son trying to take me out. And in the midst of that, what did David show? Integrity, love for the Lord, and he strengthened himself in his God. He didn't complain. Well, you say, yeah, Brian, read the Psalms. I know, but look how he ended each one. He may have started out sharing his heart, but man, did he strengthen himself in the Lord every time. And reminded himself of who his God was. That's the test. 
The test in life, guys, the trial in life, the test in life will put God on trial and say, is he really like that? Is he as good as you claim he is? Where is he now that this happened? That's when faith has to kick in because it says we live by faith, not by what we see. What if, this is what I believe. Ooh, I feel God all over me right now. What if the reward you actually receive in heaven, yeah, I understand there's, there's a stewardship and I was actually going to talk about that this morning. What if the true reward that the angels are just like, wow. Nick Billman sings a song called Delight. I delight in you, I delight in you. And it talks about how the heavens are open and he calls forth the angels. He goes, just wait and see, just wait and see what my daughter's about to do. What if it's not about so much the sick getting healed and what if it's about, watch how they handle this situation. Watch. Because the greatest, the greatest evidence that you're a Christian Guys, he's going to say to some, this freaks me out. Not some. He's going to say to many on that day, depart from me. I never knew you. You prophesied in my name. You cast out many devils. You performed miracles. But he doesn't say, those of you that had good character, depart from me. You can move in the anointing and the authority of Christ's name and still practice lawlessness. And live as if he never gave you a law to follow. Practice sin and he will say to you on that day, depart from me, I never knew you. Because yeah, you can sit there, yes, it's true. God knows you. He knows the numbers of the hairs on your head. He knows you. But if you study that out, it means intimately know. But character is what he's most concerned with. Forming himself in you. Because peace and joy and righteousness in the Holy Spirit will carry you through whatever it is that you're walking through. So that when life squeezes, why? Because there's states of being. You can't fake peace and you can't fake joy and you can't fake righteousness. Which is what? Loving the things that he loves. Living the life that he lived. Practicing what he would practice. Not just standing in your right standing with God. But that you would walk through and bear witness to peace and joy. So that the people are like, what's up with you? You Make a defense for the hope that's inside of you. And I'm not saying, guys, listen to me. I am not saying faith lives in denial. This is not faith. This is not faith. Blah, 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 blah. It's not denial. Faith recognizes the problem. It sees it. It knows it's there. It sees how hard it is. It feels the anxiety. It knows the fear. But what it says is I see something better in here in my heart. The eyes of my heart are open. I see something I never saw before. I see a God that loves me and he has promises and he's for me and he's not against me. Come on. If God be for us, who could be against us? That's your Bible. What a better time now than to believe it now. And we will arise and shine when we understand these truths. Jesus said something very similar to what Moses was describing when he took that staff and he put the bronze serpent on it and he raised it up. And he said, as long as you, come on guys, that's the test. As long as you keep your eyes here. It's not saying it's going to be easy. But if you keep your eyes here, you will be healed. Listen, man, life is real. Kids go astray. Kids take a hard left turn. Spouses take a hard right turn. Work isn't always pleasant. There's oppression and there's opposition. And those that know me, they know, those that are close to me know what it is that I pray for. And it is never for things to go a certain way. It's God, I want to be like you. That's it. Man, I bet he's happy to be like, yeah, I want you to be like me too. 
I'm not pointing fingers trying to justify actions. I'm not trying to use the grace of God to stay the same. I'm not asking Him to change this so I can be better. No, I want to shine in the midst of everything I'm in the midst of. God, take me like the enemy is scared, guys, of your surrender. God, I see and I understand it's not about me. But I can't do this thing on my own. I couldn't save myself. There's no way I'm going to make myself look like you without you. I can't change my mind. I can't, I can't do it without your grace working in me. I come before you because there's an empowerment that comes from you. Give me more of your spirit, God. I want when I get around people, I want, I want to be like a finny that shuts down a factory. Because the presence of God is so weighty upon me. But it's not going to happen because our, our pursuit's casual. There's sacrifice involved. There's discipline involved. It might look like saying no to this to say yes to that. The enemy's not even impressed right now with my ability to preach. He's impressed with whether or not when I'm squeezed if Jesus comes out. As Moses, John chapter 3, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Do you see that? Moses said, as long as you keep your eyes here, you'll be healed. Jesus is saying, when the Son of Man is lifted up and whoever believes. Why? Because what you look at is what you choose to believe. They're the same. Where you put your eyes right now is everything. The Lord is my shepherd. See, you can't say that unless you know that. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Why? Because he's the only one who can give you rest. Peace comes from him. Joy comes from him. Comfort comes from him. Comfort doesn't come from the chip bag. It doesn't come from the remote control. Comfort doesn't come from your life going perfect. Paul said in Philippians 4, it's a very famous verse, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's he talking about? He's talking about contentment when he had everything and contentment when he had nothing. Why? Because he's saying, whether I have it or I don't, it doesn't change in here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And listen to me, guys. Whoo! Seek first. That's Lectio Divina. If I'm taking scripture and I'm taking one word at a time and I'm thinking about what I'm reading. Seek, which means what? There's an action on my part. It's not going to casually come to me. First, priority. This is what counts the most. What? The kingdom of God. Not a better life, not more finances, a better job. That my wife or my spouse would change. That my kids would get their act straight. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His way of seeing it, his way of doing it, his way of thinking it. What's right. This is what he's saying. I preach it all the time. You take care of what's in here, I'll take care of what's out here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Even if you can't see it, you can't make sense of the puzzle. There's a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And God, I can't even find the border. But you tell me not to lean on my own understanding. You tell me not to try to figure it out. You tell me to put my trust in you and lean against not my own understanding. With all my heart, seek after you. And you're going to make the crooked straight. And what I can't see is going to be handled and taken care of. If I would just seek you and your face, ladies and gentlemen, that's the call of the Christian life. Is knowing God. Because what you know, you can demonstrate. The reason why it's called a test is it finds out what you know, what you reveal. 
What's your level of comprehension? But if I know the material, there's not a single test I can't pass. If I know Him, I see life. I don't see dry bones, I actually see an army. Where we might see a desert, God sees a river running through it. Where we see dry bones, He sees an army. Where we see something is dead, He sees it as asleep and it's about to wake up. Paul's goal of his whole life is Philippians 3. You sum it up, he never asked to be a better preacher. He never asked to be a better church planner. He never asked to be a better friend. He never asked to be anything but to what? But to know God. I count all these things as loss. I'll give it all up, God, so that I might know the fellowship of your sufferings, the power of your resurrection. The thing that laid hold of me, I want to lay hold of it. I press on to the upward call that's in Christ. So there's no permission to stop moving forward. Forward motion is always the motion of the kingdom. I was down in Delaware and a couple weeks ago, God gave me some pretty harsh words for that church. Because prophets, it's not just about, guys, personal prophecies. It's about saying what God's saying. Because he cares about his people. And the greatest thing God is doing right now is taking the hearts of his people and he's turning them back to himself. That we wouldn't be a people that are just, he's on our lips, but that our hearts are far away. So the spirit of Elijah is upon certain people right now, a company of prophets to wake up the church and turn their hearts back. And I went down to this church and this church had a mass exodus take place. Their key people left, gone. Just gone. Over. Can I say it? Stupid stuff. Now this probably isn't the anointing talking, but I'm tired of the nitpicking in the church. And can I be honest with you? The nitpicking is because it's about you. How's that sound? I don't like that song. Too bad. Gosh, man. Can I be honest with you? We just go where we feel like we belong and who agrees with us. Proving yet again that it's still very much like about us and the world looks at us and says, Pfft. they fight, they kick, they moan. My gosh, I, I get so tired of going out in public. And I know, I understand it gets weird because we make it weird, but people you haven't seen in months, and all of a sudden you see them in public and you're just like, oh, this is weird. We treat each other worse than the world treats themselves in a lot of ways. And we need to get over ourselves real quick because the world's supposed to know us by our love. So I went in there and the Lord said, I want to deal with the elephant in the room and I want to address the ghosts that are in this place. And I'm not talking about little, literal ghosts like boo, I'm talking about there were memories of things. And this is what the pastor said. Every time I would get up and preach, he goes, all I could see was the faces that weren't there anymore. The ghosts in the room. And I had to, the Lord sent me in there to readjust the way that they were looking at something. And sometimes adjustments don't feel good. Like they hurt, and, but it's for our benefit because truth is what makes us free. And they allowed to fall asleep what they were doing because that thing happened in their church. And the Lord showed me a vision. There was a mountain that was in their congregation and these people kept walking around it and they weren't acknowledging it and they were pretending as if it wasn't there. And nobody was wanting to deal with the fact that people were hurt, they were wounded, and they were upset. And, and I, said, I said to him, I said, you are not going to dishonor their memory just because you move forward. It's time to move forward. There's only one motion in the kingdom, and it's forward. And this is what I said to them. You can't go back and bury what's not there anymore. Lord, permit me to go back and bury my father. No, let's go. Man, that sounds harsh. No, what you go back to is what you... you we, listen, guys, it's, we can't be like Lot's wife. And it's written in there as an example to us. It's forward motion. Even in football, forward motion is awarded. When the running back breaks the line or when a wide receiver is downfield and they get pushed back from where they had the ball, but... Where they had the ball, where they were moving is where the ball is placed down. 
And there's going to be resistance. There's going to be things that try to push you back, but it's about forward motion. So I'll just, I'll end with this. I really don't, I'm not going to drag it out. The Spirit of the Lord is asking people, especially right now, this year, I preached on it on Thursday. Obviously, God wanted to go here today. You just can't muzzle the ox, man. I want to get up and just share what it is that God is speaking. The question in the room is, listen, even when your dreams feel like they're not happening. Can these bones live? Joseph had, had two dreams. They were one and the same. And he wound up in a pit for him. But it didn't mean God didn't change. It didn't mean God changed his mind about the dreams. But I'll tell you this, it took 13 years for those dreams to come true. 13 years. 25 years, Sarah and Abraham. We don't know how many years Hannah cried out to the Lord for a child. We don't know how many years Zechariah and Elizabeth cried out for a son until they got John. We know that there was a man at a pool of Bethesda, 38 years in his condition. A man at the gate called Beautiful, 40 years in his condition. A woman bent double, 18 years by a spirit. A woman with an issue of blood, 12 years hemorrhaging. Why is that written there? Is God just looking to fill space and time? No. It's because those years can become your resume if you're not careful. And that's your reason why God won't and He can't and He never will. But all the while, God's coming and He's the Lord of the breakthrough. And He asks the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to get well? Why? Because some people, they're in that condition long enough, that becomes who they are. And they have no interest in changing. They're holding on to unforgiveness. They're holding on to bitterness. They're holding on to the way that they see it. They're holding on to their rights and why they're justified and why it's always going to be this way. And Jesus is standing before each and every person and he's asking them, do you want to get well? It doesn't have to be this way. If I was that man, I'd be like, what are you, some kind of wise guy? I've been sitting here for 38 years. What do you mean I want to get well? And all that does is prove how selfish men and women are because as the angel came up and stirred the water, you think somebody would have spoke up and said, hey guys, he's been here a long time. Let's give him a shot. No, it's all about me. Selfishness of mankind. So let's not be selfish. Let's see the people who are in need right now. And let God ask you, can, can these bones live? I bet they can. It's not legal for me to have a view that the gospel doesn't carry. And irregardless, if it doesn't change in my lifetime, my Bible says he's still going to wipe every tear. Even if what I'm walking through haunts me the rest of the days of my life, those days are coming to an end and better days are coming. It's called eternity. I'm preaching, man. Ooh, I'm saying stuff that's never come out of my mouth before. And I'll be going back and I listen to me. I go back and I listen to me. I do. I'm like, what, what did you say? Can these bones live? Yeah, I bet they can. Yeah, but they're very dry, Brian. Like, guys, those bones didn't even have ears to hear what Ezekiel said. And they still came together. Because it takes a great amount of faith to speak to a situation that looks completely hopeless and dead. But God is looking for people that carry His view, not the world's view. And He'll anoint the prophets to speak. And listen, by the way, it's not just me. Every single person in this room can prophesy. Every single person by the Spirit of God. I will pour it out on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So God wants to help you to see. Why does He say... We will regard no one any longer according to the flesh. 
Wow. Why? Because it's really easy to look at people and say, well, you don't know what they did. All I have to say to you is this. I am so glad that when I knew the right thing to do and didn't do it, Jesus didn't kick me aside. And I did some heinous stuff when you weren't looking. And can I tell you something? He knew I was going to do all of it before my time, and he still said, come on, Brian, because I never lost sight of who you could become. You'll have to agree with it. Your will is involved, but I know who you can become. I wonder if I'm walking in it now. I wonder if he's going to finish what he started in me. What if he can do it in everybody else? Can we stand up? Can we pray? Yeah, I will. I'm going to have um, my prophetic teams come up here. Those of you that are on the team. And uh, listen, even if you're not on the team today and you want to come up here, you're welcome to do that. Because I have a feeling we're just going to need some people to come up here and pray. So if you're not on the team, just come up. If you're not scheduled today, you can come up. These guys are here. Listen, I know I was saying some challenging stuff and I wasn't making light of anything anybody's walking through in the room. But if I do not give you truth, it's going to keep you where you're at. I went to go put my foot down. That thing wasn't there. I don't know if anybody caught it. But these people have been trained to not just listen to you, and, but they have the ability to hear the voice of God and, and speak into what it is that He wants to do in your situation. So I just want everybody to close your eyes. This is not a time right now to be looking around. This is between you and Jesus right now. And I'm not making light of anything anybody's going through. Listen, we're all walking through some stuff. Some of us more than others. And I'm going to tell you right now, what an opportunity for the body of Christ to really shine. What an opportunity for the body of Christ to really let their light shine. Heavenly Father, thank you for everybody in this room. Man, you are raising us up. You are. God, you are raising the countenance of everybody in this room. Man, you're bringing us to a place where we see something other than what we're walking through. We see the God in the midst of the valley called the shadow of death. We see your presence. We know your presence. There's a rod and a staff that's there that's about to come for me. This is a God who's about to prepare a table for me in the midst of my enemies. You can bless me, God, when hell is coming against me. You can put a table where I can feast and enjoy your presence and experience your joy no matter what comes against me. And you said, surely goodness will follow me all my days. Surely goodness, David said, will follow me all my days. And you will anoint my head with oil and make my cup to overflow. That is the destiny of the Christian. It's not smooth seas. It's, it's not smooth sailing, but it's the ability while I'm in the midst of it, God, to prosper. And you said that your people, God, you would become poor so that we could become rich. And I don't believe that's just monetary. I believe it's the ability, God, to go through things and still live, God, like we're more than conquerors. Live like we're overcomers. So, Father, I thank you for this time that though the fire comes and though the water comes to test us, God, that you will walk with us through them in the midst of it, God. You are there. You have not forgotten. You are ever present. You are ever present help in time of need. And my Bible says that all those that call on the name of the Lord, they will be set free. They will be delivered. So I thank you, God, for provision in the midst of the valley. Thank you, Father, for walking with us even when it feels like, God, the wind is getting knocked out of our lungs, God. Even when it feels like we can't stand, you still lift us up. So I bless every person in this room and I am thankful that every tear is precious in your sight. And I am thankful that nothing is broken and nothing is damaged beyond repair. And man, I feel like you're about to show off like never before. I feel like you're about to show off what you're capable of doing in restoration and in reconciliation like never before. And I prophesy it now in Jesus' name. Come and show off in the midst of your people 
Not to put you to the test, but it's because it's your nature and it's what you've promised to do. You bring beauty out of ashes and you raise the former devastations. And you make people oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that you might be glorified. So thank you for what you're doing in our midst and in our church and in our lives. And thank you for your goodness and your kindness that never run out. They're always here. Thank you for bringing us to a place where we say it's not about us. And we're choosing to die so that we can really live. <laughs> in Jesus' name, amen. If you guys would like prayer, these people are up here. I would highly take advantage of it. Please let them pray for you. Please let them put their hands on you. Please let them prophesy into your life. Please let them be a blessing to you. If you need prayer for anything, they're here. Let them pray over you. Let them bless you this morning. If you've got to get your kids, please go and do that. Introduce yourself to them. Say hi to them. Let them pray for you.